This is CCNA Voice, Chapter 1. I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. Let's take a look at analog connections. The general idea with analog connections is they use waveforms, or the sine wave. These type of connections are infinitely variable, and so analog is a complex signal, and analog voice would be complex, and so it degrades when you send it. It's got a lot of complexity to the voice. Something like you see here would be a sine wave representing the analog voice. A typical thing with analog connections was the tip and ring. We talked about this in class and it comes in either a two wire or four wire arrangement where one wire is the um, ring that goes to the battery and the other one is the tip, which is the ground. And when you're on hook, or off hook, on hook is the condition when you have the switches attention and are ready to dial digits. And you go on hook by lifting the receiver and you go off hook by putting the receiver down. There are then two ways you can indicate an on hook and off hook situation. In order to get the switches attention, your phone could be equipped with loop start signaling or ground start signaling. With loop start, that's what we all have with our um, plain old telephone service in our homes. A loop start signal is pretty simple. All that happens in a loop start is you complete the circuit, allowing the 48 volt current to um, run through the system that tells the switch that you're ready to talk. So by lifting the receiver, you go into a off hook situation. And when you're off hook, your uh, phone is ready to use and it completes the circuit and the switch um, receives the current. With ground start, what happens is the tip and ring gets shorted to ground, causing um, uh, the switch to realize that you want its attention. This is a signaling style used by companies because it avoids a common problem with loop start signaling called glare. Glare is the condition when you can possibly pick up a line at the same time a call is coming in. Um, and that is a, a situation that is uh, magnified when you have more and more extensions on, on the same lines. And so a company would likely have hundreds of employees sharing a few outgoing lines, so they would run into that problem more commonly. And so to avoid glare, they use a different type of off-hook signal, which is called ground start. When we talk about digital connections, we need to convert our analog signal into digital. So first we talk about analog signal repeaters in the chapter, and I think this is a little misplaced. It should really be under the analog section there, but um, analog signal repeaters make the analog signal worse. They're like a megaphone. When we uh, increase the analog signal, which we have to do with any signal as it propagates down a wire, we are going to lose energy and have to reinsert energy into the signal. An analog signal repeater is unfortunately going to uh, magnify all the signal, including the noise and interference, making the signal even more degraded. Uh, with a digital repeater, it actually regenerates the original signal and cleans it up and makes it as good as new. So they're very different. Before we can benefit from digital signaling, we have to convert analog to digital. Typically, we do this using um, codecs, um, and that's a an, uh, mathematical algorithm for sampling the analog signal and representing it in ones and zeros. We use special chips called DSPs, uh, digital signal processors, that do the work of running the codec and converting our analog to digital for us. More on that in a moment. Once we're in a digital world, we often use something called time division multiplexing or time slicing. And you're probably pretty familiar with this. This is where multiple conversations can occupy the same physical wire by taking time slots or taking turns using the wire. And in analog, we don't have the capacity to do this, but once things are digital and they're in packages of ones and zeros, we can interleave them together on the wire and actually have multiple communications um, going down the wire at the same time. T1 is an example of a digital signal wire, and a digital signal wire like a T1 uses time division multiplexing, or TDM, to keep all the concurrent signals separated. There are two ways that the signaling is sent on a T1, CAS and CCS. CAS is channel-associated signaling, and it puts the signaling information in each channel. 
sometimes this is called robbed bit. So CAS is sometimes called robbed bit signaling because it robs several of the bits out of each channel to put the signaling in. So that obviously can create a big problem for data. You can't use um, T1 CAS lines to send data like emails and web pages. You can only use them for voice and video. So voice and video is the only thing you can send down a T1 CAS. The reason is it robs bits and inserts signaling information. With a CAS T1, you will get 24 channels. So you can send 24 56 kilobit streams of digital data. With a CCS, which is using a common channel signaling, it puts all the signaling in its own channel, out of band from the data. So with CCS T1s, you can use them for video voice and for data like email and web. But the consequence, you only get 23 channels for your um, data and all of the signaling is put into that 24th channel. So you can only have 23 streams of data, although each stream can be 64 kilobits instead of the 56. So actually CAS and CCS end up being the exact same um, overall bandwidth when you add up the bandwidth of all the channels. Let's look at the public switch telephone network. First, let's talk about a numbering plan. Any phone network needs a numbering plan. And the public switch telephone network, or PSTN, has a numbering plan. It's built off of E164, which is an international ITU numbering plan for the whole world. So you should take a moment and Wikipedia E.164, and that is the international numbering plan that all phone no phone networks anywhere in the world can scribe to. They all follow E164. Underneath E164 is NAMP, the North American Numbering Plan, N-A-M-P. And that's what the United States, Canada, and Mexico um, subscribe to. So they use NAMP. And NAMP has the, you know, the country code, area code, prefix, and, and then the uh, station number. So in a public switch telephone network, you have an analog phone, and those phones are plugged into what's called the local loop, sometimes referred to as the last mile. This is the only part of the phone network that is still analog. So your analog phone in your residence connected to the local loop copper wire is the only remaining part of that network that's still analog. Once it arrives at the um, CO switch, it is converted to digital. And from there on, it travels down digital trunk lines. A trunk is simply a line that carries multiple connections at once. An example of a trunk would be a T1. We also have private switches, which we sometimes call a PBX. And a private, or PBX would stand for private exchange versus the CO, which is the central office exchange. So the private exchange is typically, I called it a phone company in a box. It's a uh, phone company that a business may purchase and they can run their own extensions and have their own phones. And so in this private switch or PBX, you have two types of cards. You have trunk cards and line cards. And the trunk cards would connect to um, trunks uh, like the T1 and line cards would connect to the local loop. And then you would also have digital phones. Typically, a private switch uses digital phones and not analog phones. Although, don't get confused, a digital phone does not mean it's a voice over IP phone. Digital just means it uses ones and zeros, but it may not use packets like a voice over IP phone. So let's take a look at voice over internet protocol or voice over IP. Why are people using voice over IP? Well, it reduces costs. You get to converge your networks. You no longer need to have separate wires going to the desk for phone and for computers. And you don't need separate wires in the video conference room. All the wiring can be Ethernet. And you no longer need to purchase separate wires from the phone company. You don't need to have a voice T1 and a data T1 and uh, PSTN lines and ISDN and all the different types of lines, tie lines and all of that that you would need with a non-VoIP phone network. With a VoIP phone network, you will only need a data line. It 
bodes a lot of new features like unified email where you can get your voice messages in email so you can listen to those you could even have them uh, computer transcribed into a text message for you you can get your faxes as pdfs in your email and uh, many other uh, new features as well to get things in and out of a VoIP network, and we talked about this in class, because the whole world is not VoIP, we have to have a way to get our voice on and off of the analog network. So there has to be a way that we can put our voice back on the PSTN and turn it into analog, or get a voice that is analog into the digital world. And so we use DSPs, digital signal processors, and your chapter will talk about what those are and how many you need. Essentially, you need one DSP channel for every stream, every concurrent conversation that's being converted from analog to digital or digital to analog. Um, but that depends on the codec you choose. There are many different codecs, and some of them are more CPU intensive, and those codecs would need more than one DSP channel per, um, per conversion. The standard codec that's used is G711, and G711 is the industry standard. It's the equivalent of the phone industry's PCM, which is pulse code modulation codec. It's a 64 kilobit per second um, coding of your voice. So when you speak, it turns it into a stream of ones and zeros that goes into packets that take up 64 kilobits per second of bandwidth. Well, when we're going to send our IP packets, we have two choices typically at layer four to send them. We had TCP and UDP. If you remember those from Cisco one and two, all of our um, data is cut up into segments and it is put in either the highly reliable TCP or the highly unreliable UDP. Well, because voice needs to move quickly and it can't often be reset because we don't have time, we usually do not choose TCP because the overhead is uh, very high, slowing it down, as well as we can't utilize the features of resending since we need to play the voice as soon as it arrives. But UDP doesn't really offer enough um, features to be able to meet the needs of a voice over IP. So there's a third protocol called RTP, which is designed, um, and that's real-time protocol, and that was designed to send voice over IP conversations. It actually works uh, as a companion protocol with UDP. So RTP would run on top of UDP, adding extra features to UDP, but not all the features that TCP. So by using RTP with UTP, you get a middle ground. RTP uh, does time stamping and that allows you to avoid situations like jitter where with the timestamp you can make sure you play the voice at an even distribution so that it sounds normal instead of compressed or extended. It also has some other features that we'll go into in later chapters.